Before the 1970 Baltimore Colts could become world champions, they would first have to overcome the shocking defeat the 68 Colts had suffered in Super Bowl III. Super Bowl III was an obvious turning point in the history of the National Football League and what had been the American Football League. There was such disdain from the NFL toward the AFL. There was such horror at the very notion that one of us might eventually lose to one of them in the game. We were about to be validated as the greatest team in the history of the National Football League. We were 15 and one going into the Super Bowl. I swear, I don't think we were complacent. We prepared well. We didn't just go down to Miami and go to the beach. I think we were favored maybe 17, maybe 18, maybe 16 points. And the AFC was some slept league. And Namath is picking this Vaughn and Baltimore secondary to pieces right now. He may go, and he's in there. Snell scores. There's the throw, and it is intercepted. This game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions in a stunning upset. They have beaten the Colts handily here today. Coach Don Shula's team had been handed the most stunning loss in Super Bowl history. It was one of the best teams I ever played with, and uh, we lost to somebody that we would beat 8,000 times after the Super Bowl. It was uh, humiliation to be kind. After the game, the team gathered at the Miami estate of Colts owner Carol Rosenblum. It was supposed to be a victory party at Carol's house. And uh, we, we all went over, the whole team. I was at the party. Yes, indeed, he had my uh, relatives down there and everything. I got drunk. Something possessed me to walk up to Mr. Rosenblum and to this day, I don't know why I did it, but I said, I want to tell you one thing, Mr. Rosenblum. We will get back here and we will win, I promise. It was well known that Carol was upset and who are you going to get upset with, the head coach. I don't recall ever reading anything publicly that Rosenblum had said that was disparaging to Shula, but I think there was an undercurrent of that. It was the biggest embarrassment of his career to lose the, you know, the Super Bowl for the first time to, to an AFL team. I mean, I know it really hurt Carroll. Usually, Mr. Rosenblum didn't say anything to the team, but he met with us. And I have a vivid memory of the meeting. And he stood right next to Don Shula, and he said, now, men, I'm not in this business to be humiliated and embarrassed to come in second place ever. I've already fired one coach who won two world championships for me. I want you to understand that I'm interested in one thing. I'm interested in dominance and the world championship. Are there any questions? In 1969, Don Shula and the Colts would be under the microscope all season. They barely won half their games and failed to make the playoffs. It wasn't the same. Nothing was the same. You always pay attention to details, and we didn't do that that year. Maybe it was the residual effect of Super Bowl III. By the end of 1969, communication between Shula and Rosenblum was virtually non-existent. Taking advantage of the strained relationship was Miami Dolphins owner Joe Robbie, who was in the market for a new head coach. Carol Rosenblum was in the Orient vacationing. And Steve Rosenblum, his son, got a call from Joe Robbie, and Joe Robbie asked for permission to talk to Don Shula. Now, where it gets cloudy from that point on is, did Steve Rosenblum say, yes, you can talk to him, or I have to wait till my father comes back? We don't know. But at least Miami's story was that Steve Rosenblum granted permission. When Carol came back, he said, Steve isn't authorized to, you know, to, to give permission. And I'm, I'm denying that this is, I think, probably after Shula had already been appointed the head coach at Miami. 
So he contested it and Pete Rozelle gave us their number one draft choice because of the confusion surrounding this. And I think we just had three intractable egos there with Joe Robbie, Carol Rosenblum, Don Shula, three really hard-nosed, tough guys, competitors, and I don't think any of them ever apologized to anybody, and I doubt if they ever uh, would have, were they all still living. After waiting more than a month, Rosenblum selected longtime staff assistant Don McCafferty to be the Colts' new head coach. This afternoon, we're just going to start out with a regular practice and play catch-up football mentally for him. We're going to throw a lot at him, and these are men who've been through this before, and they, it shouldn't be too much problem for him. I think he went with McCaffrey because the team was driven through Unitas' eyes. And I think that having a quarterback coach, somebody who, you know, ran the game through the quarterback, although nobody ran the game for John, but I mean, worked with John, was probably a good choice. It's a perfect guy for that team. Having gone through the turmoil of Super Bowl III and, and the turmoil of losing Shula. Well, I think he might have been a salve, kind of calm things down a little bit. You didn't want to have a... Um stone thrower or a, a whipper come up to beating up people. If Shula was going to leave, bring somebody that had a calming influence. Mac would do some things that other head coaches would have never done. He would sit down and play a hand of poker and, and throw in a couple of bucks. He was such a nice guy that you didn't want to play bad and disappoint him to a point where he could possibly lose his job. Some of the players on the team thought he was lax. He wasn't lax. We practiced the same way. We practiced just as hard as we did with Shula. We wouldn't have won all those tight games had we not worked hard. had a lot of turnover. I've thought of us as all old veterans at that time. That's not true, because we had so many new people on the team. These new faces would also be playing against new competition. The Colts had reluctantly left the traditional NFL for the freshly minted American Football Conference. None of this seemed to matter to a cocky, long-haired rookie kicker named Jim O'Brien. There might have been a beatnik, I think, in those days, hippies and beatniks. You know, their karma was interfacing at the apex of their lives or their biorhythms, blah, blah, blah. He wasn't really like that. He just happened to have longer hair. O'Brien's hair is down to his shoulders. In fact, his nickname was Lassie. He was a little brash, too. So, you know, he wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, the, the most humble guy on the team. So he was not very, very popular. But we opened the season in San Diego. We're behind 14 13. United leads us on a late drive, ironically, because that's the way the season's going to end. O'Brien kicks a field goal. Jim O'Brien, a rookie who has booted two field goals in this game already. Morrow holds out the hand. There's the snap. The kick is up. It's long enough. It is. Good. Oh, it's off the hand. 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 Oh, the next week in the second Monday night game ever played, we just got obliterated by the defending world champion Kansas City Chiefs. We had not sodded the infield yet. And in the first quarter, they scored 30 points towards the infield, which was the close end of the stadium. And all I remember is dust flying all over the place and our defensive backs trying to chase their receivers into the end zone. We were just utterly, abjectly manhandled. They had nine sacks on our quarterbacks. They just killed us. After two subpar performances against former AFL teams, predictions of a Colts cakewalk through the AFC were being hastily revised. That really put a stigma on our image the rest of the year. They were basically burying us as, a, as an aging uh, team that had, had, had run its course. Nobody was happy about the Baltimore Colts coming to the AFC. And I remember going back to my teammates saying, you know what, we better buckle it up. I think these guys are coming after us. I think they would like to humiliate us. A week later, the Colts struggled against another former AFL franchise, the Boston Patriots. In the fourth quarter, a familiar face came to their rescue. 
We were ahead seven to six. Unitas was now in the game, and we were trying to run the clock out. Whatever you do, John, McCaffrey said, don't throw the ball. United takes the snap, a handoff, fake handoff to Maitland, pass down to the Roy Jefferson, he goes to the 30, the 25, he's going in. And the coach broke it open quickly with a 55-yard scoring play. That was the famous close-up of McCafferty. I don't think 100% seriously cursing John as John walked to the sidelines, but that was John. Whatever you do, John, don't throw the ball. That's exactly what John was going to do. In Houston, Unitas came from behind twice with touchdown passes to Roy Jefferson. Unitas takes the snap, goes back to throw, looks downfield, sets, fires long. There was a whole different football team, an entirely different way of doing things. We were decimated. We lost our entire starting backfield. We lost Tom Maddy, our best football player on offense, the very first quarter of the very first game. So now we got a rookie running back, Norm Boulash, who might carry the ball and run 18 yards, and most likely he's gonna fumble every other time. We lose our fullback, Jerry Hill. Our quarterbacks are both nicked, Unitas and Morrill. But we had these weapons. We had Eddie Hinton and Roy Jefferson at wide receiver, both of them great athletes. That's when you started seeing a lot of trickery. That's when you started seeing gadgets. The main job of an offensive play caller is to get the football in the hands of your best players maximum number of times. We really had changed our, our whole approach at that point because now we had some real speed on the outside and some size. And our offense got better, but we were a throwing offense. So were Joe Namath's New York Jets, who the Colts would face for the first time since their devastating defeat in Super Bowl III. We knew what was going to happen. Everybody knew what was going to happen on the team. I imagine they knew it, too. We are going to kick their ass. Goes back to throw on first down, and it's batted down. I could beat the Jets a thousand times by a hundred points. It would never make up for that lost Super Bowl. But this being the first game coming to play the Jets, I just wanted to kill them. They were back to throw again. This game to me is what turned the whole season around. I think it basically put us in the driver's seat. And I think from that point on, we were a different team. With the Jets out of the way, Baltimore fans turned their attention to the next showdown opponent on the schedule, the Miami Dolphins, and the return of the Colts' former head coach. The people in Baltimore, they knew the schedule better than I did. And they said, what are we going to do against Miami next week? I said, is that who we plan? They wanted to win it because it was Shula. It all came back to Shula. I've missed Baltimore and I've missed the fans on 33rd Street and I'm sure I'm going to get a different experience with the fans on 33rd Street tomorrow. It's glad to see he was back in town because I like Don a lot. It wasn't going to impact how I played the game, whether I would become more aggressive because Don's back in town. I wasn't into that. Maybe Rosenblum might be more aggressive or talk more aggressively or all the, the fans might be hissing and throwing tomatoes. I think McCafferty might have said something like, you know, CR would really like to win this one. <laughs> and I think everybody would laugh. At the midway point of the 1970 season, the Colts were in control of the AFC East and on track to reach the playoffs. Among the members on the 1970 Colts, Bill Curry was one of many active participants in the Players Association. That summer, teammate and union president John Mackey joined with Curry and the rest of the rank and file to organize a strike protesting labor issues with league management. The strike lasted probably a week. It was the first week of training camp. 
basically the entire league honored the strike except one player. At least only one prominent player broke the strike day one of reporting day. That was Mike Kurtz. As nice as Bill Curry may make comments about me, you have to remember that he was a union guy and he was rooming with a scab that was particularly stressful for him. My view was asked to report to work and they were paying me more than I ever thought they should ever pay me. I was asked to report to work, so I go to work. I was naive about that, I'm sure. Mike's my roommate. We discussed this whole situation at length, and he's doing what his conscience dictates is the right thing. Uh, there'll be no resentment on my part. I realize that he made a decision, and, and uh, while we didn't agree on it, we don't agree on a lot of things, but we're still friends, and uh, we'll be roommates when training camp starts if Mike wants me. During practice, the guys might cuss him, but they love him on Sunday. And that's the way it was with Mike. He was our guy that set the tempo. When we warmed up on Sundays before the game, Mike and I, we smashed our shoulder pads together and we butted heads. And I knew by the time I went back in the locker room after warmups that I had been hit harder than I was going to be hit the rest of that Sunday. I knew that. He was very intense about his position. I was intense about my position. You run into people in tents, you're going to have some sparks sometimes. But we knew why we were there to perform. That's why we got along. One player Curtis did not get along with was quarterback John Unitas. I was going on this pass one time, Unitas. So I just crossed the line of scrimmage, and he hit me in the head with the ball from behind. And I came back and told him, if he ever does that again, I'll kill him, and all his linemen won't be enough there to protect him. He could be a um, trying person sometimes. He can't read everything right every time, and uh, that's why they put erasers on pencils. When you make mistakes, you can erase them. Fortunately, ours always cost us six points or something. His way of the highway sometimes, I'd hear him talking to the coaches. He wouldn't do something or he, he thought it was dumb or he'd call a player the coach didn't have. If I was a coach, I would have duct taped his ass. Curtis had a far better relationship with defensive teammate Bubba Smith, number 78. Smith was Baltimore's most devastating pass rusher, but out of uniform was a gentle giant. I just had him over for dinner, and Bubba sits on a piece of my furniture, and like the legs are bending. I said, hey, Bubba, you know, you, know, you gotta have to be careful. Can you sit over there somewhere? No, I wanna sit here. Anyway, the darn couch is leaning and everything, and my wife's like sweating BB. He invited me out to his house to eat dinner and gave me one piece of chicken. I said, you know, Bubba, we all have our own amount of food we're going to have, blah, blah, blah. I drove 30 miles for one piece of chicken, and I had to stop at Carmel Sanders to eat dinner driving home. Curtis was much more generous serving out punishment to opponents. His ferocity earned him two nicknames, Mad Dog and The Animal. In order for me to perform to certain standards that I might have, I had to prepare myself. In that particular business, physical solutions were the crowning glory. And the business I am in now, commercial real estate, physical solutions rank at the very bottom of the proper behavior schedule. What I liked about professional football was I was able to resolve disagreements immediately. And you're not penalized like serving jail time because of it. You're encouraged to solve your difficulties that way. And I still miss that, in fact. I, th I mean, I'd like to have the opportunities where you could go around, you know, step in a ring and resolve things physically. A great feeling. Mike's brand of frontier justice was vividly displayed at Memorial Stadium when a spectator decided to become part of the action and one of these idiots runs on the field and picks up the ball and starts to run around and the crowd's cheering. He was a hubcap popper out of Rochester. I think his job was to put on tires on the assembly line for the truck or some crap like that. Mike's kind of watching him out of the huddle and then suddenly this blur 
and he could just fly. So I just gave him a flipper. I didn't try to put his lights out. Mike just stood there and looked at him for a second and jogged back out the hole. Nothing unusual in his mind. Bill Curry was most distressed. I don't know how many prayers he said that night, but he was most distressed with my behavior and my reputation with the league. Bubba Smith and I walked over to his locker and we said, Mike, did you realize how bad you made all of us look by hitting that poor guy? He said, look, that guy came into our place of business. I enforced the city ordinance that prevents him doing that legally. And that's what I did. And I don't have any regrets, and I don't have anything to say to you two about it. In mid-November, the division meeting Colts began to stumble, beginning with a lackluster tie against the lowly Buffalo Bills. Drops back to throw, looks down, fires right side, it is complete for the touchdown to Marlon Briscoe. The next week after the Buffalo fiasco, the tie, um, we go down to Miami, and this time they are ready for us. We didn't play a good game. We really got beaten badly, 34-17. But that was a big loss now. That really hurt. And Rosenblum wasn't real happy about that one, losing to Shula. And then the next week, um, we go out to play the Chicago Bears, and you always know that's going to be a physical, spitting, kicking, nasty, cussing, knockdown, drag out, black and blue thing. And five minutes are gone in the game. Unitas has already thrown three interceptions, and we're down 17 to nothing. Fires up the middle, and again, it's intercepted. If you have to describe the difference in good and great quarterbacks and the, the undefinable ingredient that the great ones have, it starts with total amnesia from what happened two seconds before. That's the classic Unitas game. Remember that? The game's over stacked. They're giving you over. They're just giving you over 15. John Unitas never changed expression and you can't tell whether he's thrown a touchdown pass an interception or just gone to a sunday school picnic you can't tell he never changes we keep playing we keep plugging and as was our want we managed to scramble around and find a way to get back in the game open on it too no, I wasn't open. No, I'm just saying that I can beat my... The last offensive play of the game is a double zone with a busted coverage, and there's John Mackey alone. He was not the primary receiver. Fires another one that's complete to Mackey, and he may go. He is going all the way for the touchdown. And here's the other thing I remember. John Unitas runs off the field. He still hasn't changed expression. Business as usual. And that's why we were able to hang in there and win these difficult games. The Bears, that was a wake-up call for us. We knew that we had to start playing better. Something is wrong. So now we got to regroup. The night before their game with the Philadelphia Eagles, a players-only meeting was held. The keynote speaker was a reluctant but angry Mike Curtis. This was the last chance I had to do something. So, um, I hate doing that. I don't like to be public about that stuff, but I needed to take care of business. Mike had never made a speech. And he stood up and he said, I got a couple of things to say. We haven't been the kind of football players that we should have been. And I just want you to know one thing, I'm watching you guys. We got six more games to play. We got three league games, then there'll be two games leading to the Super Bowl and then there'll be the Super Bowl. So we got six games left to play. It's not too much to ask for every man in this room, do your job. And I want you to know that if you don't do your job, I'm gonna find you and I'm gonna kick your ass personally. He 
was talking to the offense, but the defense took it personal too. We got to do this. We couldn't afford to lose the game. The defense demolished the Eagles and Baltimore earned a decisive victory. A week later in Buffalo, the Colts wrapped up the AFC East crown. And the pass is intercepted this time by Charlie Stokes of the Colts with that interception just tight. The Eastern Division Championship, the AFC. Two or three different points during the season, it looked like we were not going to make the playoffs. They come back through all of this and the fact that we had had a little slump and still coming on the you know heels of, of the last two years. Now we're back in the playoffs. Home field advantage all the way through the playoffs. We have a chance to get to the Super Bowl. There was a lot of joy. Magic of the Baltimore Colt relationship with the people. It wasn't just the city of Baltimore, it was the state of Maryland. That magic has never been reproduced anywhere else. And here I am all these years later, I get goosebumps. I get teary-eyed because I would be the first player introduced. For reasons I've never understood, the center was the first guy introduced. Introducing the offensive unit of the Baltimore Colts. And I never knew who was going to be standing in that dugout. I'd come out the end of the tunnel, and there's Jack Nicholas standing there because he's a buddy of Tom Maddie's. They were Ohio State. So I shake hands with Jack Nicholas, and that fired me up just to run out on the field. It was not like any other experience I've ever had anywhere else in my sport. But it was a beautiful thing to be a part of. I'll never, ever forget it. Another Colts advantage entering the playoffs was a Spartan playing surface that disoriented opponents. We hardly had a field to play on. We, they made us paint a logo on the 50 and in the end zones, and we just painted over mud. I mean, if you ever look at pictures of that game, it's all dirt. It was our traditional Astro dirt. It got in your mouth, it got in your shoulder pads, it got in your jock. We can play in it, we can breathe, they can't. They ain't got a chance. I mean, it was just another advantage to us. The handoff goes to Robinson, sweep to the right side. He is in trouble. Mike Curtis is there and runs him out of bounds at the 30-yard line, a loss of five. The young Bengals were no match for Baltimore. The Colts cruised to a shutout victory, but would face a much tougher and more confident opponent in the first ever AFC Championship game. When Oakland came in town, they came in packed to go to the Super Bowl. George Atkinson said, yeah, we're going to leave here and, and go to Miami. I said, what, what are y'all going to, uh, to the game? You got tickets? I said, because, man, we're going to beat the hell out of y'all. And I broke free right away and hit LaMonica, and he went down, and that brought George Blanda in. Every time you got a chance to take a lick on him, take it. And I think George was around 43 at the time. His body is not ready to take those licks. They would start saying, kill, Bubba, kill. Kill, Bubba, kill. And it got loud. Your heart started beating faster. You were ready to, to snap this guy's neck if necessary. Blanda has the Raiders set now. Takes the snap. Drops back to throw. Looks downfield. Oh, he's got it. Nailed him at the 42 yard line. With the game still close in the final minutes, it was time once again for the old master to seize the moment. In the championship game with a three-point lead and pretty much on our own territory, that's the formation with Ray Perkins 
at the fullback position. And he motions out of the backfield. United throws him a swing pass. United is set. Drops back to throw. He's got the time. He fires the pass. It is complete to Ferguson. The 25 down the sideline. To the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. He's in. Ray Ferguson hits the TV. And that was the touchdown that gave us a 10-point lead and clinched the game, and the trunks went back to Oakland, not to Miami. Hey, we ain't playing anything, baby. <laughs> sweet, sweet. Right on. Hey, where'd it go, baby? Let's go, baby. The Baltimore Colts, seven seconds to go, are the AFC champions. There's the end of the ball game, and it's on to the Super Bowl now. John Sandusky when Mac had moved over to coach the defensive line, but formerly had been my offensive line coach, Big John Sandusky came over and just hugged me. And I remember it was terrible because he hadn't shaved and he scratched my face big time. But it was, it was a wonderful moment. There was a lot of emotion after we beat Oakland. We were going back to the Super Bowl and maybe because of all the buildup of the previous two years and the embarrassment, I don't remember anything that anybody said. I do remember that there was more affection and emotion that day than any other day. Super Bowl V would be a battle between two teams yearning to redeem themselves for past failures. The Cowboys were known as next year's champions. The label on them, they couldn't win the big one. And we were trying to overcome the scars of Super Bowl III. It was a game played in total desperation, which is why I think, I think it was so frantic. We were desperate to win and to look good doing it. We didn't want to just win. We wanted to win and be convincing. We felt like we were tougher than the Dallas Cowboys. We felt like that they could not stay with us for four quarters if we went out there and took care of business, did not turn the ball over, played well in the kicking game, and just flat whip them physically. We thought we could do that. Now, we didn't do any of those things. We didn't whip them physically. We didn't uh, take good care of the football. We didn't play well in the kicking game. We didn't do any of that stuff. I think they were pressing them too hard sometimes. They weren't relaxed going to the game. I wasn't relaxed. I think a lot of it because the guys put a lot of pressure on themselves to push harder for both sides. I think that's why it was a carnival. Glenn Messler, who was a terrific player and one of our better offensive linemen, came off the field and said, George, I can't block Bob Lilly. And George said, Glenn, you have to block Bob Lilly. And in the final analysis, Glenn did a pretty good job against, you know, you could make a case, one of the two or three greatest defensive tackles in the history of the National Football League. It would be a wrestler block on both Lilly and another Dallas lineman that ignited the longest play of Super Bowl V. John goes back to throw again. Sets up, fires out left side. Take it right down! Off the fingertips of the intended receiver, bounced into the hands of John Mackey, and he goes in for the touchdown. Well, I'll tell you something about the John Mackey touchdown that nobody knows. Glenn Ressler is our left guard, really one of the unsung heroes of those great Baltimore Colt years. Well, it's a delayed play because he's stuttering, see, so you might have to take a little bit more out of it. You do that? Glenn did something that's almost impossible to do. It was a great athletic maneuver. Bob Lilly, the tackle lined up over Glenn, crashes to the inside gap. Jethro Pugh loops around, and he's going to come clean, and he's going to earhole John Unitas. He's going to smash him. Glenn goes above and beyond his duty by doing somehow a 360 whirly gig and cut Jethro Pugh, knocked him down so that Unitas is able to stay upright and deliver that ball. Mackey's catch tied the game at six, but an extra point, in fact, any Jim O'Brien kicking attempt, would not be automatic. In my recollection, we had played one game in our history on artificial turf. So we're now at the practice the day before the game, which is nothing but a walkthrough. O'Brien did not have a good day of practice. He said to me, I hope they're not counting on me Sunday. I said, why? He said, I can't kick on this stuff. He was a straight-ahead conventional kicker. 
He said, I take a divot like a seven iron, and I, it, if I try to, you know, the way I kick, my foot's bouncing into the ball, I'm kicking the top half of the ball. There's the snap. The kick is blocked. It is no good, and we have a tied football game. United hits Mackey for the touchdown. He misses the extra point. I mean, it's blocked, but it's low. So uh, you can imagine what my feelings were the rest of the day about the game coming down to Jim O'Brien. The game would not come down to John Unitas. An open field hit late in the first half sent the injured Colt quarterback to the sidelines for the rest of the day. We felt terrible looking at John sitting over there holding his ribs. It was almost nothing that could get him out of a game, so we knew it was bad. I assumed that it punctured his lung because I didn't think anything else would get him out of the game. You had this feeling that you couldn't win this without Unitas. I mean, it, it was almost like this is his game. His injury kind of deflated me. Uh, very shortly after that, I went to the field. I couldn't take it anymore. I've never done that before or since. Uh, and I just went to the bench. Now, I shirked my duties. I should have been in the press box, but I didn't care at that point. Now, our defense was only fifth in the league in total yards allowed. They were number two in points allowed. What does that mean? Here's what that means. You might get it inside our 20-yard line, but you're not going to get it in the end zone. And that's what happened to Dallas. Our defense goes out and stones them again and again and again, allows them one touchdown all day. That's amazing. Trailing 13-6 in the fourth quarter, an interception by Rick Volk, number 21, set up a Colt touchdown to tie the game. Then in the final minute, Mike Curtis capped an extraordinary performance with the most important play of Super Bowl V. Second down and many, many yards to go. Morton rolls out to the right. Gets the pass away down the sideline. Intercepted by Mike Curtis at the 25, the 20, down to the 23-yard line. The Colts have the football. I'll tell you what it was probably, I never admitted this, that um, the eyes of the Dallas offensive line was so had so much hate in them that I needed to get down quick because they're going to kill me if they ever got a hold of me. So I just danced around a little bit to avoid contact and then fell down. Now our bench is jubilant, but knowing what I knew, having heard what O'Brien told me, his, his words were, I hope they don't count on me Monday. Well, who are they going to count on? I mean, this th if this comes down to a field goal, what are we going to do? The Colts pinned their championship hopes on number 80, rookie Jim O'Brien. Like Cool Hand Luke, I never saw him panic in nothing. Playing cards, uh, uh, in practice. So I didn't feel like he was going to panic then. If you don't believe in God or if you don't believe in prayer, you've never been on the sideline of a Super Bowl. We did have some prayer circles. We had some deeply devout guys who didn't always come off as such. Nine seconds showing on the clock. The Cowboys and the Colts all tied up at 13 to 13. We had done something that very few teams had done. We had picked up a player named Tom Gould. He was an old, tough guy from Mississippi. He was really beat up, could hardly run, had been a center. but in Don McCaffrey's words, was the greatest snapper I have ever seen. Well, he's, even to this day, I would say that. I mean, they were lasers coming back there. That's all he could do. And I'm thinking, why are we carrying goo just to snap the ball? This is before we know that today, you wouldn't dare have your center snap the ball. You, everybody's got a snapper. Some teams have two snappers. And I'll never forget, when I saw that ball come back tomorrow, my first thought was, thank God we got Tom Goot. Because the snap was perfect. The kick is up and is long enough. It is good! A 32-yard field goal by Jimmy O'Brien. It is good. He nailed that one. It went clear up into the stand. And I think you got to give a lot of credit to Jim O'Brien. He not only saved our Super Bowl rings, but he saved his locks that day. Because once we got inside, Billy Ray Smith said, boys, we can't do it. We can't cut the kids' hair off. We had planned on doing just that. It was going to be fun. So uh, we had a little ceremony and told Obi he had saved his hair. And the Baltimore Colts have won the Super Bowl.
Super Bowl V, um, this ring right here, that um, emblematic of our return to glory, dominance, all that sort of thing, is the most mixed sense of achievement that I've experienced in my career. In all my years, Super Bowl V evokes from me a sense of having not carried our share of the load. I didn't feel redemption. I didn't feel like we went down there and took care of business, conducted ourselves on the field like champions. We turned the ball over seven times. And after enduring all the slings and arrows of the previous two years, you would have thought we would have been near perfect that day. There is the snap. The kick is up and is long enough. It is. Now, when he kicks the field goal, I got depressed. And the Baltimore Colts have just won themselves the Super Bowl. And I knew I was supposed to be feeling good. Finally did it, world champions. I wasn't feeling that way. I couldn't really feel as happy as I wanted to feel because I, I was supposed to look at my other ring from Super Bowl three and say, well, I got two, and I couldn't do it. That loss, Christ, almost 40 years ago, um, is the, uh, the grave baggage. Super Bowl three. I still haven't gotten over it. Doesn't help that I won 200, made a bunch of things. Bunch of war, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean flip to me. It's losing that jet game. Until this day, they'll have that game on, and I turn away right away. Because I don't want to start, I don't want to have no dreams about it. 1970 remains bittersweet for Bubba Smith, Bill Curry, and Mike Curtis. Unlike other Super Bowl champions, they remain burdened by their memories. There's nothing more I can do. I leave football and move on to the future. I've worn the ring four times. I think it's, I, I have it in the pocket of one of my suit jackets, kind of where I hide it in my house. It was the last championship for any Baltimore Colts football team. It was not the redemption that we desperately sought for what had gone before. There's almost a sense of um, longing. Um, gosh, if we could just do that again. And, and that's a bunch of old men wasting time. That's what that is. There's something sad about that. Maybe old competitors just never grow out of that zeal for wanting to have done your best when the heat was on, when the crucible was at its most demanding. You just can't help but wish we had done a little better. And I guess we'll go to our grave like that.